Appreciate it, Coach. How are we all doing? Good? Brett's uh, got you moving and whatnot. Um, I don't know if you can see it. My contact information is right there at the bottom left. If you have questions, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, if you want to ask a question, if, you, if something comes up, feel free to email me. Um, I will get back to you. I can't promise when, but I will get back to you. Um, sometimes I'll even call. People leave their phone number and I'll call them and they'll pick up the phone like, hello? I'm like, is this whoever? They're like, yeah, who's this? And I'll say, it's Brandon Marcel. like, oh my gosh, I didn't think you'd get back to me. Of course I'll get back to you. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, it only helps everything and helps the profession. So um, we're talking about eccentric training today. And uh, really quick before I get going, because I tend to run out of time, I want to go through some thank yous. So uh, I want to thank Play. Uh, for putting this on and investing in our profession, pushing it forward, trying to make everybody better, give them some more tools uh, to become better what we all do and what we all love. I want to thank Coach McKeefrey for, for having me. Um, again, we have, we've spent a lot of late nights in lobbies of hotels discussing books, discussing strategies, discussing our many mistakes that we have made over our careers um, and, and how we've kind of fixed those. Um, thanks to Versapulli. Kirsten, they're in the back there, and I have one of their machines here that we're going to talk about when we deal with eccentric training today. Um, something that we're going to realize is not new, but we are kind of putting back into the cycle of things. The other presenters that are here, um, man, there's some, some really good people. Um, so I'm like the, yeah, everybody else, I'm like, I, I got to follow these people. This is crazy. And then you guys, thanks for taking the time out of your weekend uh, to become a little bit better uh, and to kind of invest in yourselves. So where I like to begin is with a question. This is a question that I often get. So I get emails and people pull me aside and always after they ask the question they want, they say, Brandon, do you have any books that you would recommend? Oh uh, yeah, I can recommend some books. So I'm gonna to start today with, with one book that I would recommend, okay? And I'm gonna have a couple in here. Not many, but I'll have three or four, okay? The first book I would recommend is Never Trust a Skinny Italian Chef. Okay, and I'm Italian, I love Italian food, and this is great advice, but you might say, what the hell does Italian food have to do with eccentric training? It doesn't, it has zero to do with eccentric training, but it has everything to do with making spaghetti sauce. What does spaghetti sauce have to do with training and eccentric training? Well, it actually has more in line with training than you think. I took this at the local supermarket in San Diego where I live. I backed up as far as I could and took a picture to get as many varieties of spaghetti sauce that are out there, right? And there's tons of varieties, right? And if you look at the back of the ingredients, they're all different. They all have different ingredients, different amounts of the ingredients. So my question to you is, which one is right? They're all right. Even though they're very different in what makes up the spaghetti sauce, they're all right. The only thing which would be wrong is if like, they didn't use tomatoes, right? That'd be a problem. Right? But at the end of the day, these are all right. And this, how this ties into training is all we're dealing with is really with our training is ingredients. Okay? What is your recipe that you use in training? What are the ingredients that make up your training, your programming? How do you sequence them? Are there some that you might be missing? So here's my recipe. I'm a movement-based methodology. Movement comes first. I'm looking for good movement, clean movement, and sustainability of that movement. I'm not just looking for high performance, I'm looking for sustainable high performance. Great, you can do it once, but can you do it again and again and again and again? Strength first. I'm mostly a power all the time guy, but strength has to come first. You have to be strong enough to take one step before you can take two. Strong enough to take two steps before you can take three. So I believe in strength. Obviously, if you're assuming that everybody's mobility and stability is fine, but that's another one. Evidence-led versus evidence-based. I'm an evidence-led guy. Okay, it's exactly what Matt was talking about before. Everybody gets tied up in, you gotta be evidence-based, you gotta follow the research. Research is based on statistics and statistics are like a bikini. It reveals what's appealing, it hides what's vital, right? So it, it just becomes this big mess of things. Matt's laughing because he gets the research and the statistics piece, right? But everybody gets so caught up in the research. And what's funny is he was talking about how his paper got rejected seven times. Uh, a friend of mine, his name is Bill Dement. Bill is about 85 years old. He discovered REM, REM sleep. You guys heard of it? Yeah, he discovered it. His paper on REM sleep back when he was in his 20s got rejected seven times as well. 
So it's kind of funny is that people are quick to reject things because they haven't heard of those before. So it's interesting. So what's evidence led? Well, it's utilizing that art and research, that blend that Matt was talking about, that right of center. So are you using evidence to kind of push you somewhere else that nobody has been before? Or are you just relying on it to give you the answers? Or are you not relying on it at all? So I'm an evidence-led guy. But in terms of that, where do I begin? I look at my ingredients and say, well, what does the ingredients bring? And that's what this book is here. This is actually one book I would recommend. It's called The One Thing. And to summarize it, it says, what is the one thing by doing it will make everything else easier or unnecessary? So when I program stuff, I evaluate my athletes and I'm like, okay, what's the one thing that I can give them? If I have five minutes with my athlete, what is the one thing I can give them such by doing it will make everything either easy, easier or unnecessary? Now, if I have 10 minutes, what's the one thing I can add? What's the next ingredient I can add? What's the next tool that I can use to enhance their performance? Because really that's what we're doing, right? We're, we're giving you tools for your toolbox, okay? And the missing ingredient that I find is eccentric training. Well, we do eccentric training. You know, we use bands and we uh, alter tempo and we go down slow, right? But we spend so much time in the concentric world and we spend so much time working on enhancing strength and hypertrophy and power and those types of things, we spend more time upgrading the engine but forget to upgrade the brakes. So if you're not upgrading the brakes, when that new strength and that new power start to come into play and you ask the athlete to decelerate that new strength and power which you gave them, they're gonna have a hard time doing it and that's when some undesirable things can happen. So it's not just merely about strength, it's being able to manage that strength. Can I generate it, but can I dissipate it as well? Again, eccentric training is a missing ingredient. It's another tool for the toolbox. Because like the old saying goes, if you don't have many tools, right, you get stuck. And if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, even when it's not. So you don't want to get stuck in that. You always want to try and say, what's that next ingredient? Okay, so first things first, what, what the heck are we talking about? What is an eccentric contraction? What's that lengthening contraction, right? The muscle is contracting, but it's lengthening. It's not shortening, it's now lengthening. Put simply, the opposing force is greater than the amount of force your muscle can generate. So something external is stronger than you are. That's all we're talking about. What's its purpose? It's twofold. That's why I have that shock absorber there. That's what an eccentric contraction acts like, a shock absorber. It dissipates forces first, and then when you switch to a, a concentric contraction, it acts as a spring. So it helps give you back power. So twofold, one, absorbs and dissipates, two, springs back and helps gives you power. Okay, that's a good thing. What is eccentric training? Well, it's training that emphasizes that type of contraction to an extent. And we'll talk about the specifics of eccentric contraction and I'm gonna show some, some examples of that. And why is it needed? Well, I think we know why it's needed, right? Here's the problem. This is the rub, right? Players are asked to repeatedly stop, change direction, cut, abrupt decelerations, reaccelerate. Let me see you use that power. Let me see you use that strength, right? So these decelerations and change of direction need to be enhanced. How can we enhance it? Well, through eccentric training. And you can see this in all sorts of sports, right? You can see the eccentric component. The dude on the left, he's got some serious eccentric contraction going, right? The guy on the right's gonna win this. We, we pretty much know how that's gonna end, okay? We can look at any sport. The, uh, this guy right here, look at that. You know there is a deceleration right there. This guy's about to have one, okay? Very important in that sport. Oh, look at this, eccentric training. Deceleration on a clay court with tennis. Let's look at another example. Volleyball. In hitting, there's eccentric contraction. Landing, there's eccentric loading as well. Okay? Sprinting. Yes, sprinting. Now, there's differences in different magnitudes of eccentric training and eccentric loading. There is eccentric loading and, and happening up here, but there's greater amounts of eccentric loading on the lower half of Allison. Okay, if that makes sense. So she, yes, she's having eccentric contractions and eccentric loading, but they're lower force. The higher force are happening here where the sprinting is actually happening. happening. Okay, uh, baseball, obviously. Deceleration of the shoulder. We know that shoulders move. If you try to move your arm and internally rotate it, 
without any lower body forces, you're probably gonna get about 700 to 800 meters per second, right? If you, or degrees per second, if you incorporate the whole body of pitcher, it's around 8,000. That's a significant amount of force now that you have to decelerate and stop, and that's where injuries happen, right? In the deceleration phase. Swinging, okay? Not only the swing and bracing and lengthening here in the lower half, but if Jessica Mendoza misses that ball, she now has to decelerate that bat, and there's a lot of eccentric forces that are happening, okay? And we develop asymmetries as a result. Asymmetries can be a good thing, okay? But the issue is, why is this important? Because it matches the goal of our training program. We need to know this, because the goals of a training program are threefold. One, decrease the injury potential. What does that mean? We are making their availability greater. Coaches just want to make sure they can pick any player they want and put them in at any time, right? Our job is to make sure that we increase the likelihood of that happening. We're not magicians. We can't cross our arms, bow our head, and all of a sudden we're injury free, right? The idea is we're trying to stack the odds in the favor of the athlete not to get injured and increase the odds of the coach to be able to play them whenever they want. Second goal, improve performance. That's next. Can we make them better at what they're doing? Can we make them better football players, tennis players, soccer ballers? Can we make them better softball players? Whatever the sport is, right? Can we do that and can we enhance their performance while decreasing injury potential? And number three, educating them. Tell them why this is benefiting them. What is the value, as Matt said, what is the value of doing this exercise? What is the value of performing this drill? Brett was talking about it as well, okay? But if we look at it, we can find some pretty good information in what the research says and some statistics here. So if we look at hamstring injuries and groin injuries, which happen a lot in soccer and happen in groin injuries happen a lot in, in ice hockey, which I think ice hockey is an aquatic sport. Would you agree? Just frozen, right? Okay. Um, athletes with a history of reoccurring hamstring and groin have a greater than two-fold deficiency in eccentric strength compared to concentric strength. Huh. But it's like a chicken or egg thing, right? Which do, did, did the injury cause that or did that cause the injury? We don't know, but it's still important information for us to have, okay? Furthermore, we know that strain injuries occur when muscle and tendon fibers can't maintain the tension. Remember what I said the definition of an eccentric contraction was? When opposing force is greater than the amount of force your muscle can generate. That is what that says. So if you don't have enough eccentric strength, that's when bad things happen. If you can't dissipate the forces being asked of you when you're cutting, changing direction, when you're lifting, whatever, that is when you expose yourself to a greater risk of injury. So the basic recipe, what do people do? Well, we do some eccentric training. We typically use free weights, gravity-dependent weights. We might use some cable stuff, but at the end of the day, it's really gravity-based weight training, right? Sir Isaac Newton is in the driver's seat while we put all these, this weight on the bars and we go up and down and up and down. Sometimes we move and we'll do forward lunges and backward lunges and different things. We'll add bands and chains and those types of things, right? We can alter tempos and get more of an eccentric training, but it's really truly not the same. We'll talk about that here in a second. And that begins with a lot of misconceptions that we learn in ex-phys. Right? When you're in college and an undergrad, you take exercise physiology. You may even have one of those two books. Okay? I had them both, unfortunately. Okay? And they're good, but what do they always tell you in ex-phys class? What do they say eccentric training does? Say soreness. Soreness, exactly. Great job, guys. Good. Okay? So soreness is not good, they say. So yeah, you don't want to do eccentric training because it creates DOMS, and if you're doing research and you want to get people sore, you want to do DOMS research, you do eccentric training, and it's, it's, it's you know, the negative contraction. While those things are right, it doesn't mean those things have to occur. And that's the big issue. The other thing they teach you in ex -phys class is they teach you the force velocity curve, but they only really show you this right-hand side. They never show you the eccentric side of it. We always talk about the right-hand side. This is what we need to follow, and then we do, we do this, right? We have this type of training. Well, here's, here's the force velocity. Here's what we talked about. Matt even talked about it. Velocity-based training. Here's accelerative strength, overcoming inertia. We use band-assisted squats. Okay, how do I improve speed strength or strength speed? Well, you know, Olympic lifting is great. It's mostly speed strength, but it does tend to move up here into strength speed. 
This is where band, so low bar weight with high band speed comes into play. The reason I have a star here is because there's a lot of starting strength that is involved with these. So you got to keep in mind that just doing Olympic lifts doesn't mean you're going to get good at these. If you have crappy starting strength, you're not going to be a good Olympic lifter. You need the whole, the whole curve here. Starting strength, there's Joe Ken in his beard phase, right? Uh, that's overcoming a load. That's using chains. Absolute strength, Franco Colombo doing a deadlift. But how do you do all this? How do you get this? Well, if we use bands and chains, we know that we're tapping into this, but we're probably only going to about there. We're not really appreciably moving the curve. That's what we want to do. That's what they teach us in x -Fizz. How do you push this curve to the right? Well, how do we move this curve? How do we push it up and to the left? That's where eccentric overload training comes into play. That targets all of this. It can target here, too. There is a concentric side to eccentric training, but it focuses on this just as much as the other piece. Okay? And keep in mind with that force velocity curve, I know load and tempos can change everything, and it's just a checklist, right? It's a continuum. There's not these absolutes, so just keep that in mind. I, I use it as a checklist. It's a representation. Okay? But what does eccentric training, what does it really bring to the table? Okay? This is some of the cool stuff. You get faster gains. You get faster gains in hypertrophy, strength, power. With that, you get better enhancements in speed, better enhancements in change of direction. Okay? Why can it occur faster? Well, you can generate more force. So think about it. If you can lift two to three times more weight, are you going to get stronger faster? Hell yeah. Are you going to put mass on faster? Absolutely. Are you going to be able to generate more power? Totally. So because you can generate two to three times more force, that gives you an edge. That's the whole thing, right? Can I get better in the weight room quicker? All right, sign me up. I'll do it. And the funny thing is these adaptations can occur at a very low level. Only 45% of your max 1RM, 1RM eccentric contraction which you got to remember is two to three times more. So you don't need a lot of intensity, which means you don't need to have soreness and inflammation as a prerequisite. To get and to elicit a training response, you don't have to feel miserable the day after. You don't have to feel sore. Just something to keep in mind. The other benefit, enhanced shock absorption and enhanced spring. So what happens is the muscle actually stiffens up. Now people think, well, it stiffens, that's not a good thing. Well, I'm not talking about like stiff, like neural tension, like my muscles feel miserable type of thing, okay? Not a range of motion point, and we'll talk about range of motion next. We talk about muscle stiffness, the, the, the muscle sarcomere, that sliding filament theory that they teach you in x -Phys, okay? There is a, a training response to that. And, and, and in the, the tendons and the myotendin, myotendinous area, has some really cool positive adaptations and it becomes stiffer. When it becomes stiffer, it means it's more resilient to force. What that means is now it takes even more force to create that lengthening. The muscle is stronger. The muscle withstands more force. If I withstand more force, it means I can make more mistakes on the field and not get hurt. That's a good thing, okay? It also means it improves speed. I change direction better. I'm more efficient. If I'm more efficient, I don't fatigue as quickly. If I don't fatigue as quickly, because at the end of the day, it's not about the team at the end of the year that goes up, right? Ever. It's about the team that does that last. Everybody loses their performance. They drop, they drop, they drop. But who can sustain the longest and drop last? That's really all we're dealing with, and that's what this deals. Um, again, you can withstand more force and generate more power in the muscle and tendon. That's really what we're dealing with. Repeated bout effect is a side effect of eccentric training, and it's kind of neat, right? So they don't teach you this in x -Phys class. They teach you you get sore. <laughs> Who knew that there's this adaptation that's actually a protective effect with eccentric training? So you do eccentric training one day, all of a sudden your body responds and gives you a protective effect so you don't feel the soreness, you don't feel the negative effect, it prevents against further muscle damage, 
assuming you're doing the same type of patterning of exercises. Now all of a sudden, if you throw an exercise that you've never done before, then all of a sudden that all bets are off, you may have some soreness. But if you keep with normal in-pattern training, stuff you've already done, you're gonna see a great benefit. You're gonna have a protective benefit which can last a very long time. I mentioned the stiffness, it stiffens the muscle 10 unit, it remodels the myofilaments. Um, there's some other cascade of events that happen with heat shock proteins and all these other things that I'm not gonna get into. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a benefit. Range of motion, this is that passive stiffness versus range of motion, okay? You actually can get an improved range of motion through eccentric training. So remember what happens. Everything is governed by the nervous system. Everything we do, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's a skill, whether it's sprinting, whether it's running, change of direction, it's all governed by the nervous system. And as Matt said, there's that called cerebral governance. Is that what you call it, Matt? Cerebral governance, where your brain says, maybe I don't need to go to that end, end range of motion. So why does, if I turn my head this way, and I can't go anymore, but you can passively turn it farther, well, why can you turn it, but my brain won't give me that range of motion? Well, it doesn't think I'm able to handle it. It's a motor control issue. I don't have control to turn it all the way. If I load myself eccentrically and eccentrically train the musculature of my neck, or really any limb, all of a sudden now I'm able to establish better control of those end ranges of motion. So now I'm stronger out here. That's where the bad stuff happens. Bad stuff doesn't happen in here. When limbs start to expand and get out and I start cutting and changing direction, throwing limbs out here. You see water polo players all the time, right? They're trying to stop balls, goalies out here. That's where bad things happen. If I have better control at these end ranges of motion, I'm in a much better position to decrease my injury potential. Doesn't mean I'm not gonna get hurt, but it means the likelihood of it's significantly less. So it actually enhances range of motion, gives me protection at these end ranges, and it also optimizes torque. What do we mean by optimizing torque? Well, we know through looking at muscle and performing eccentric exercises, the pination or the fiber orientation of the muscle actually changes. What does that mean? Well, it gives me that greater ability to generate force here. So I don't have to be in here and tight. I can generate force out here, okay? Well, how do we implement it? There's a lot of devices out there that can do it. There's the yo-yo, there's the K-Box, there's the VersaPulley, which I have up here, which we'll show today. There's the Desmotech. There's all these different types. They all do the similar types of things, okay? They're a little bit different, right? So as you can see here, like, these are pretty much, you stand on them, they're all land. They're pretty much all just more like a, a vertical integration. Um, VersaPulley, you can actually get a, or you can do vertical and you can do horizontal. A little more bang for your buck here. But again, the point being is they're all an inertial flywheel system. Now this stuff's been around since the 1920s, okay? That's what's funny, it's like what's old is new again. Well, how does this stuff work? We have a rotating flywheel. So it's a big round disc, and the disc weighs some specified amount, okay? So you can change the discs, you can add more discs, you can add more weight with the VersaPulley to generate more force if you need to, okay? So what happens is you don't have to rely on gravity. You don't have to rely on gravity to drop you down to a squat. You don't have to rely on gravity to move any of these hammer pieces back to their starting point. It's all force dependent. Whatever force you put into the machine is what you get out of the machine. So it's very much up to you how much force you want to give into it. Now there's some pretty cool things too which you can do to take out the impact even further which we'll show you a little bit later on. So there's no weights, it's non-gravity dependent. You can train at any plane, at any speed, at any load. That's pretty cool. You can't do that with a barbell. I'm not saying don't use barbells. You use them, they're good at certain things, right? Matt and I were talking earlier, it's like what do you use a hammer for? I use a hammer to drive nails. I don't use a hammer to cut wood. Right, I use a saw for that. So barbells are great for certain things. Flywheels are great for other things. Um, dumbbells are great for other things. Bands are perfect for other things, right? So it really depends what, what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to cook? What's the, sp oh, spaghetti sauce, well I need tomatoes. There you go, so you pick your ingredients based upon that. 
okay? Well, how do I program it? This is the cool stuff this we're gonna talk about. Remember, the body only knows stimulus and response. That's it. Stimulus and response. If you are not getting the desired response out of your training program, you need to reevaluate the stimulus. That's all the body knows. If I take my finger and I rub it back and forth on this podium five times, I do not have enough stimulus to elicit a response to make a callus. Now, if I sat here and rubbed it 300 times really hard, what's going to happen? I'm going to get a blister. If I keep doing that, it's going to get a callus. Stimulus and response. That's with anything human, anything physiological. If I don't have any weight on the bar and I'm squatting, am I going to get stronger? No. I don't have enough stimulus to elicit a response. That goes with conditioning, it goes with flexibility, it goes with stability training, it goes with mobility training, it goes with studying, it goes with everything, right? So stimulus and response is what you have to think about when we're talking about this. When we program, simple. We plan backwards, we execute forwards. It's not a simple, well, what Joe Ken and I laugh about, which we call improvisational periodization which is, let me write the workout on my way into work, in my brain. What are we gonna do today? Mm -hmm. Okay? So you have to plan. You plan backwards, execute forwards. Using this system, I like this system here, horizontal vertical integration, a gentleman by the name of Istvan Baye. He's considered the inventor of long-term athlete development. This guy, he's Hungarian. He's considered the best in the world for planning and periodization. Super nice guy if you can get through the accent, okay? But this is a good thing to follow, vertical integration, step on this, build skill on that, build speed on that, build strength on that, build stamina on that, and then you push it out across a 52 week or quadrennial or however long you have to plan. Remember, more isn't better. Just because we haven't been doing a lot of eccentric training doesn't mean you need to do more. We need to do all eccentric training. Brandon was up talking this weekend, so we're just gonna do nothing but eccentric training. More is not better, the power of less. What is the minimal effective dose? No need to put extra mileage on the athletes, unneeded mileage on the athletes. Still can't put the car in the garage and keep it running. That's still wear and tear on the engine, okay? So we're looking for the minimal effective dose. And that's the nice thing about eccentric training is it also comes with a lower metabolic cost a significantly lower metabolic cost. I had that slide somewhere, I don't know why it didn't show up. So anyway, it's important to work in all three planes of motion. Now remember, this is like kind of what Matt talked about as well, specificity, sport specific. It doesn't have to be sport specific, it just has to be sports transferable, exactly what he said. Can it transfer to the sport? So it's funny, because you, know, you, you look online and you, you, can, you, you can YouTube anything, right? So which, which one do you pay attention to? If I YouTube like eccentric training for soccer, just made that up, I don't know, right? And all of a sudden you see some guy, like he has like a, the Versa pulley attached to his ankle and he's trying to kick, right, with a soccer ball, time and time again. Is that specificity? It's probably stupid more than anything, right? But what's funny is, is like how do you know if that's good or not? Because it has the most views on YouTube? Well, does it have the most views because it's really good or does it have the most views because, dude, you gotta check this out, this is terrible, right? So you don't know. So keep that in mind with specificity, but it's important is what I'm saying here, you need to train, train in all three planes. Sagittally, frontal, and transverse. You need to have sagittal stability first. You need to be able to be stable here, then be stable frontal, transverse last. And remember with everything, every exercise is a test, every test is an exercise. So if you have an athlete that is not proficient, don't progress them, regress them. And we'll talk, I'll show you some progressions and regressions here in a little bit. Just like there are different loads concentrically, there are different loads eccentrically. There's eccentric overload, which is abrupt, and there's eccentric deceleration, which is controlled. Eccentric deceleration is what we do with bands and chains. That's controlled. You can still do this on a Versa pulley, but you can also do the abrupt training, which is where I will start getting this flywheel moving, 
or maybe a coach will move it for me, so the coach is doing all the concentric work, and then for the first two thirds of that recoil, I'm just going with it, and then I'm stopping it on that final third. That's eccentric overload. You can't get that through bands and chains. The overload training is where you get these responses that I was talking about. The enhanced range of motion, the dissipation, the greater dissipation of forces, and the greater force development after that. And we'll bring some of you guys up to play with this a little bit. So how much? Well, you gotta keep in mind that 20 to 60% of eccentric strength is greater than max concentric strength. Remember, you can do more work at a lower metabolic cost. There's a lower cost of doing business. Well, I get more for less. It's called a value, right? That's exactly what I'm going for. Most studies, and when I say most studies, these are like the legitimate studies. So like I'll go through a lot of different studies and say, no, I'm not paying attention to this one, not a good study, not a good study, not a good, oh, this is a good one, okay? So this just encapsulates the decent ones that I found. Most of them go four to eight weeks, two times a week, three to four sets, five to 10 reps. That gives you a starting point, a place to begin. That gives you some science. So now you can move toward the art a little bit and apply it to your scenario and your situation, right? Because what is the different ingredients that you might be looking for? Wrong button. So when progressing, progressing anything, eccentric training falls under this progression. This has served me well my entire 21 years in this profession. All of my progressions are based upon this, these big six. It doesn't matter if I'm doing speed, if I'm doing stability exercises, strength, power, it doesn't matter. Everything starts here. I move simple first and I go to complex next. Stable exercises first. Then I go to unstable exercises next, which unstable exercises typically are more complex. Then I move from slow to fast. Slower movements are usually more stable and more simple. Faster movements are more typically unstable and more complex. Progressive resistance to rate of force development. I progress the resistance. Then once I have mastered that resistance, how fast can I move that resistance? So I'm moving large amounts of weight. I've progressed to that point. Now can I move large amounts of weight fast? Because that's really what we come down to with athletics, right? Who can generate the greatest amount of force in the shortest amount of time? Those people usually win the game, okay? Mastery to next limiting factor. Have they mastered it? And I'll be quite honest with you, I don't really always stick to that one, okay? They usually have to show a very high level of proficiency, but I don't have to have them master it 100% because then the athlete gets bored and crazy, okay? So they have to have that proficiency, but then I'll move them to their next limiting factor, which could be different. And then we work pre-program to random. Pre-program means I'm giving you instructions on where to move and where to go. You're gonna go that cone, you're gonna make a left turn, you're gonna backpedal that cone, you're gonna carry Oko back to this cone. That's pre-program, they know where they're going to go. Random is what sport is. I don't know which way I'm going to have to move or run. Track is pre-programmed. Run straight, make a left turn, right? That's pretty simple, okay? Football, tennis, those other sports are not pre-programmed. They're random. I don't know where I'm going to have to run to next, okay? So if you look at some progressions, here's some examples of what I use. Here's how to read this chart. This is a squat progression and regression, right? So it's a lower body push example. So, um, can't really see at the bottom here, but the default exercise is bold, okay? Which is a goblet squat. This means with my clientele, who I work with, this is where everybody I want them to start. A goblet squat with a kettlebell. So this is more simple as we go lower, more complex as we go up. If they can't do a goblet squat, they do a kettlebell squat. So instead of holding it up here, they're holding it down here, okay? If they can't do that, they just do a body weight squat. So I have these for every exercise that I ever program. So I can immediately progress an athlete or regress an athlete at a moment's notice. Now your default exercise might be here. It could be here. You might work with like 85 year old women with heat rash, so yours might be here. Right? I, I don't know, you can move that default exercise wherever you want, but for my clientele, I want them to do this proficiently. If they can do a goblet squat really well on day one, 
I'm not gonna sit them with four week programs of goblet squats. I'm moving them to kettlebell singular double racked position. Now let's see a squat. Then we'll go to a back or front squat. Could be high bar, could be low bar. What's their limiting factor? Don't know. Then I might move to a barbell plus bands or chains or both, not at the same time, right? Then most programming stops here. But now, uh, this is where I like to use eccentric overload training. So we'll do an eccentric overloaded squat. Pretty simple. Here's another example, RDL progression. People come in, it's a lower body pull, a hip hinge example. They all come in and can they do a goat bag RDL? Dan John's goat bag RDL. That's what I want them to be able to do. If they can do that, we go to a barbell RDL. We might do an SLDL. Again, these are kind of, depends. Then a barbell plus bands and chains. And then we'll do a versipulley eccentric overloaded reactive RDL. So again, most programming starts here. And I've used this in the past, we've used this, let's see, I've used the VersaPulley since maybe 2000. So when Mark Verstegen and I started Athletes Performance, which is now Exos in 99, we were running the business out of a condominium, right, his condo, and then we were running our athletes out of an, a, a, an old Staples office supply building, empty. But we had all the garden variety type of exercise, but one thing we got, we got the VersaPulley, and this was like our secret sauce. All of a sudden, we were seeing some big changes with this, and that's the evidence-led approach. It's still research. I may not be doing a peer-reviewed study, but I'm doing abductive research, which means I see this happening, therefore it's probably true, right? It's kind of like if you pop off to your mom when you're six years old, well, at least mine, she takes the Italian assault weapon, which is a wooden spoon, and smacks you. I didn't need to do a peer-reviewed research study to tell me that. Right? I just learned that through abductive research. So what we saw was that all of a sudden we're seeing some pretty great benefits and fast gains with our, with our athletes using this training that most places stop. I'll give you another example, forward lunge progression. So it's a lower body unilateral example. Um, they, can they come in and do just a kettlebell forward lunge? Then we'll do a barbell. Then we'll do a deceleration lunge, which means the weight is pulling me into the stack. Can I decelerate that with a Kaiser? So a Kaiser is giving me a consistent load. Now when I go to the VersaPulley, all of a sudden, wow, I'm, I'm getting yanked back a lot more. Okay? Actually, I'm going to need a volunteer. Who wants me to volunteer? Anybody want to volunteer? Come on up. Look at that. <coughs> So I'm just going to keep talking, but I just want you, oops, actually, um, I need a large human. He just got volunteered. Come on up here. You're my large human. I just want you to hold that down. And if it doesn't work, we need a large human to stand on his back. So I just want you to kind of play with you. Ever use one of these? No. So I just want you to kind of play with it. Well, I'm going to keep talking, but just kind of get used to kind of how it feels. Okay. Okay? Just, it's very rhythmic. So you'll see it coil and uncoil. Kind of let it take you, pull with it. There we go. Perfect. Just get familiar with it because we're going to use you for the dumbbell row. Okay? Um, so then you have the RDL progression, um, and you can do an eccentric overload there. Remember, because we're getting stronger at end ranges, and that's the most important thing. Where are my athletes vulnerable? And range. Where are my athletes vulnerable? Deceleration and reacceleration. Okay? Even the deceleration, reacceleration of sprinting, right? Because you have to remember that when you're dealing with absolute speed and you see athletes running, all of a sudden they're running down the track 100 meters, all of a sudden somebody goes, ah, they grab their hamstring and they drop. There's still a huge eccentric load there, so it doesn't mean I have to stop and change direction. I still could be moving. How's it feeling? Good. Good? Good enough to win? That's what I want. All right. Uh, forward lunge, a push progression, regression. So again, same thing, simple to complex, upper body push example. I just use a, a bench press, why not, right? So you have a dumbbell, this is, um, can you, this is my default, actually, it's not highlighted. Everybody starts with a push up. Can you do a push up well? God, I hope so, right? But you'd be surprised how, what's funny, I do a lot of work in the military right now, like spend most of the bulk of my time consulting with the Department of Defense. That's one group that's got the push-ups down. Makes sense, right? That's all they do. Then they go to dumbbell bench press. 
uh, a bench press, then we'll add bands and chains, then we can do a, a standing press with a versa pulley. Try and pull a couple more of those with little heavier loads, just to kind of, let me get you going here. All right, there we go. Let it coil and uncoil. One arm row progression, this is where I'm gonna use my friend here, okay? So again, can you do a one arm row supported? So this could be like a dumbbell row. So you're just here supported, a typical dumbbell row. With my dumbbell rows, sometimes I'll do a sca stable scap and a mobile scap, which means I'll have them hold their scap stable. Can you give me movement or can you prevent movement when I ask you to? Or a, a mobile scap, can you retract the scapula and row and give me mobility when I want you to, okay? So you can do that supported. Then you can go to a Kaiser, a one arm row, then you can do a one arm row propulsive. And then, you okay to do this? You don't have any like shoulder issues, do you? Yeah, okay, good. I didn't care anyway, but I just thought I would ask, right? It's like you say, do you need help with that? Well, no, I was gonna help you, I just wanna know if you need help. So essentially what I'm gonna have you do is just a one arm row. So I'm gonna have you stand in this position here. Actually, I'll put you in the offset position. And I just want you to row, pull, just a nice and easy, rhythmic pull, okay? So this is what's called an eccentric deceleration, meaning he's pulling and he has to slow it down. What's your name again? Garrett. Garrett? Yep. Again, I didn't even ask it the first time. What's his name? I should have said, right? So now a couple ways we can do this. This is just an eccentric, keep pulling, keep pulling. So now as a coach, one thing I can do is I can also pull this. So now I'm pulling most of, a little different, right? Yeah, now he's having this, he's gonna be sore tomorrow, he's gonna be swearing at me, okay? So now he, I'm creating more eccentric loads, so now he has greater eccentric uh, contraction to slow it down, okay? Changing arms? Yeah. Okay, Probably that's fine. So now I'm gonna have him do something else, which is the abrupt deceleration. So I want you to start really yanking on it. Start pulling, all right, pull. Then I want you to pull, and then I want you to let it go, hang on to it, right? But kind of let it pull you in two thirds and then try and stop it on the final third. Okay. Big pull, a little different, right? But keep it going too. So essentially, so some two words. There you go, perfect, see that? So completely different, all of a sudden he has to put the brakes on after it's, it's been winding up for two thirds of the movement. When he puts the brakes on, it's a completely different sensation, completely different feeling, okay? And they're gonna, we'll have this back there. I, I'd play around with it if you want. I mean, that's totally what, imagination is your limitation with this. That's what's pretty cool about it. And then you can get to a propulsive row. Let's see if you can do this one here. I'll show you what I want you to do here. So a propulsive row, I want you to get to the, the end range should be here. So you're gonna sink, you're gonna push out of your lower body and rotate. So you're driving out of your lower body. Does that make sense? Pivot all the way around, pivot. Good, so pivot all the way on that outside foot like you're pushing, driving, good. Push and drive out of your lower body, good. Push, harder. That's what I wanna see right there. So he can do that, you can rest now, perfect. He can do that or I can pull make it easier for him on the concentric side, now he has to decelerate it even more. That's where the fun stuff comes in. That's where the big bang for your buck and value comes in with the eccentric overload training. You can't do that, right? You can't push somebody down with bands and chains, right? That'd be a problem, okay? Probably like an HR violation too at some point, right? So you can't do that, but with this, you can. You can pull on that rope, generate more force for them to have to decelerate. That's what sports is all about. How do you dissipate forces? How do you handle forces? It's stress. How do you dissipate that stress? How does your body handle that stress? How can you take that stress, dissipate it, and now use it to your example to, 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 to turn into something else beneficial, right? How does that feel? Completely different, all of them? Yeah. Okay, thank you guys, appreciate it. Give me a hand, please. So again, that's the beauty of it. You can, you, can, you can go horizontally, you can go vertically. There's platforms that you can still, you can do squats. Um, you can do forward lunges where it pulls you back in. You have to now decelerate the lower limbs. Uh, the, again, 
it's completely, the world is your oyster. Here's a chop and lift progression that I use. So if you use any types of chops uh, or lifting exercises, my basic chop and lift is a variation of a sequence. I start tall kneeling. Can you do it from here? Can you go to half kneeling? Half kneeling in line, standing offset, standing in line, and so on, then go to a split squat. If you can follow that progression here, then we can take it propulsive and do it faster with a Kaiser. So we're moving very fast. We're doing chops and lifts. Then again, most programming starts here, stops here. Can you do it with a versa pulley? So all of a sudden you've just added a whole nother phase to your training. Now the beautiful thing you might say, well, when can I use this? You can use it off season, pre season, in season and reconditioning. So you can use it in the developmental stage. What is it used for? Well, to develop that outer limit range of motion control. I'm preparing my athletes to be stronger, faster, maybe hypertrophy. Well, I can get them there faster. So maybe I don't have to spend as much time in the developmental, or I can spend more time doing some other things that I've always wanted to do now that I have a little bit extra time. You focus more general and specialized application, and you progress according to the big six, which I showed you. Simple to complex, stable to unstable, et cetera. Preseason, now you use it to augment. Before you use that, that was develop. Now we're augmenting that outer. I now that I have outer range control, can I get that outer range stronger? Step one, achieve it. Step two, augment it and make it better. Okay, it's a specific application. They're higher velocity pattern movements. What do I mean by pattern movements? They're used to doing it. They've been doing RDLs across developmental stage or a variation. They're still doing them just with eccentric overload. We're still doing chops and lifts. We're just doing it with an eccentric overload. In season, yes, you can use it, but stay in pattern. If you go out of pattern in season, guess what's going to happen? They're going to get sore. So stay with in pattern movements in season. And it's great because there's a lower metabolic cost. So they're not revving the engine. The RPMs aren't as high. So they can spend their dollar, they can spend 90 cents on the dollar on the field and spend 20 or 10 cents in here. 90, 10 is a dollar, yeah, right? State school, sorry. Um, and then remember, you get that repeated dot effect, which is protective. So as long as you're doing pattern movements, now you're getting that stiffness. They're able to absorb and generate force and power. Like, when I look at this, it's that risk versus reward. What's the downside of doing eccentric training? My athletes get better? Like, that's the worst thing that's going to happen, which is pretty cool. Um, if you're getting rehab and reconditioning people out here, once baseline strength has been established, start doing eccentric training. The body stimulus and response. If you have force being pushed across the body, your, your body responds appropriately and we'll start developing that strength. And then you can use it for any, I hate the term return to play. I like return to participation, right? Because when coaches, as you guys know here, return to play, oh, get them out there. Eh, they're not quite ready to play. They're back in to participate. They haven't gone through my stuff yet. So, um, so you can use it in that reconditioning phase. So quick little wrap up. It's all about stimulus and response. Doesn't matter if you're doing eccentric training or not. If you're not getting your desired response, evaluate your stimulus. Two, it's an underutilized tool. People just aren't using this. Okay? High end programs are using it. This will help your athletes. It's one thing, it's an ingredient that people aren't using that all of a sudden make a huge difference. There's a lot of value in it. Specificity. Mention that, it doesn't have to be specific, just has to be transferable, Matt even said that. It's great when you don't plan presentations, but you guys say the same things. It's like, I feel smart because Matt said it. Uh, it has a velocity-based training application. There is a readout here that you guys can't see, but you can adapt it to velocity-based training. So you can quantify it. You can live in that concentric world of developing starting strength. You can live in the speed strength world and still develop the eccentric side of the force velocity curve that they don't show you in x -Phys class. That's what's really cool is that you have a way of applying it and it's quantifiable. You can write a number down. I want you to stay above this force, above this number. 
uh, greater speed, strength, power, hypertrophic gains you get from this. Remember, you do not need delayed onset of muscle soreness to elicit a training response. As low as 45% max will give you a training response from eccentric overload exercise. So you don't have to crush them, they don't have to feel miserable. You can use it year round. Again, if you stay in pattern movements, please you know, use it in season. But if you're gonna use out of pattern movements, do that in the developmental time, okay? But th that's important there. There's a lower cost of doing business, like I said, so it doesn't expend as much energy for the athlete. It doesn't wear them down as much. It improves the stiffness and resilience, the shock absorber. It allows them to handle and dissipate forces greater. So the muscle can dissipate force. If the muscle can't dissipate forces, it goes where next? To the tendon. If the tendon can't dissipate the forces, what's the last line of defense? Say ligament. Ligament, good, very good, right? So ligament is like the last line of defense. That's when we see MCLs and ACLs because now they're asked to handle and dissipate forces that they're not made to do, right? It's like, okay, the, the dad's driving the car. The dad can't drive the car and mom jumps in. Oh, great, mom's driving, mom can't drive the car. All of a sudden the toddler jumps behind the wheel, right? It's not equipped to drive, right? Bad things are going to happen if you ask the toddler to drive, okay? Um, and then you get the repeated bout effect and increased range of motion. So there's a lot of upside. If our number one goal is to reduce injuries and improve performance, we need to look at what is the missing ingredient that we're looking for. And if we can have a better grasp of what that missing ingredient is, then we get better spaghetti sauce. See, I tied it back together. It was weak, but I tried. Okay, I get it. Um, I'm out of time, three minutes over. Uh, I'll be available for questions. If you have any or any thoughts or if you use it, please, I'm, I'm here to learn just as much as you guys. So thanks again for your time.